First, let me introduce uh, where we come from. Uh, we are, are working for the regional sea programs of the United Nations Environment Program, which was launched in 1974 by uh, UNEP. And uh, this regional sea programs right now covers 18 regions across the world today. And Northwest Pacific Action Plan, we call it NOPAP, is one of the regional sea program of, of the UNEP. And uh, it was adopted in 1994. China, Japan, Korea, and Russia are the member state of this program. Uh, the, the map on the right bottom corner shows the geographical coverage of the NOPAP region. You see uh, the, our seas are surrounded by poor countries and uh, yeah, North Korea too. And uh, in, in this region, uh, there are uh, four regional activity centers uh, located in each country. And uh, NOPAP SILAC is one of the regional activity centers of the NOPAP. And uh, we specialize in monitoring and assessment of coastal environment uh, using satellite remote sensing. And uh, recently, we have been leading uh, the uh, development of tools, uh, especially using the cloud-based uh, technologies, uh, such as uh, Google Earth Engine or Amazon uh, Web Services on Earth, uh, trying to uh, uh, develop web-based tools for mapping uh, eutrophication or coastal habitats, including seagrass. And uh, in this webinar one, we will be using a seagrass trainer. Oh, this is, I found a typo in my screen. A seagrass mapper on the left in the middle and a seagrass trainer on the right. And these tools are available from our uh, map seagrass project portal. Uh, you see this apps and map sections uh, of the uh, mapseagrass.org website, uh, you will be able to access Seagrass Mapper and Seagrass Trainer. Uh, during the hands-on sessions, we will be both, uh, we will be using both tools. So, uh, yeah, please remember just the names of the, these two uh, cloud-based tools. And uh, back to the uh, case study, uh, let me first introduce where is Nanao Bay. Uh, Nanao Bay is located in the center of Japan, uh, facing the uh, Napa Sea area. Here is uh, one big peninsula facing the, uh, the Napa Sea. And uh, in the middle section of Noto Peninsula, uh, there are three bays, uh, three enclosed bays here. And uh, one of the, the bay here is the largest seagrass habitat uh, in along these coastlines. Uh, there are another uh, seagrass habitats in the western section of Toyama Bay. And, uh, I, I will not be introducing this one uh, at this time. Uh, in this bay, we have been observing uh, a massive scale die off of Zostera Marina uh, uh, recent years. And the local scientist claims that. Uh, high sea surface temperature uh, in summertime uh, kills uh, seagrass, seagrass, habit, uh, seagrass uh, uh, species, Zostera marina in this case. If the temperature exceeds 30 degrees Celsius in summer, uh, a lot of them uh, uh, cannot survive. So uh, uh, this figure is a comparison of 2012 to 2014, and only 2012, uh, the surface temperature exceeded 30 degrees Celsius, and it caused massive sea gas die off. So this is uh, background information in the no Bay, and uh, the case study here uh, that I'm about to present is a comparison of uh, 2015 and uh, 2000. Yeah. 2019. I also uh, uh, tried to uh, 
uh, understand, try to understand the uh, interannual changes of seagrass habitat uh, from 1994 to 2012, uh, 21, using all these uh, sensors, uh, Landsat A, uh, uh, OLI, Sentinel-2, MSI, and Landsat-5 uh, thematic, uh, enhanced thematic mapper. The few data uh, obtained by underwater video camera uh, from ship and the stand-up pod, pod, stand paddle surfboard were taken 2015 June and uh, October the same year and uh, June 2019 and October 2019. For image correction, which I will be introducing a little bit details on the uh, 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 the second day uh, tomorrow, uh, we use atmospheric correction by deep water method and uh, water column correction by water uh, bottom refractors index method. For, soup, or for classification of the image, uh, we used supervised classification by random forest method. And uh, we use 70% of training data uh, for uh, uh, of, uh, as a training data to make a model for estimation and uh, the remaining 30% for validating the model. These blue trucks are the, uh, the ship trucks uh, and they, by, we have set up more than a hundred sampling locations uh, to deploy this type of underwater video camera. Uh, my colleague will uh, explain the details of this ground truthing work uh, tomorrow. But uh, from this picture, you can get some brief idea of how we uh, conduct uh, seafloor substrate or surveys. Uh, for very shallow water, uh, which uh, where are very inconvenient to access by ships, uh, we use our, our stand-up puddle surfboard, uh, and uh, we uh, we also carry GPS and uh, 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 digital steel camera uh, to to study what's on the uh, shallow uh, the sea floor and the shallow water. So these green trucks comes from the, uh, uh, the move by the, the stamp of stand up paddle surfboard. So after obtaining the uh, sea floor information uh, in each uh, sampling point, uh, we have to define features and their classes uh, from collected information. Uh, in this case, uh, I defined there are five classes, sparse glass like this, sand bottom, dense sea glass, and sea glass with sargassum and sargassum. And based on this information, uh, we prepared uh, training data sets just like this. So as I said, there are five classes. Uh, by the way, in the uh, exercise we will be using tomorrow, we will be merging this, the first one and the second one. But the idea is that, uh, yeah, uh, from the images taken by the underwater video camera, uh, you need to create this kind of training data set. After you, uh, you create training data set, you, you ingest, does uh, data set into our Seagrass mapper. And uh, here is the, uh, the sample uh, training data set you see uh, in uh, 2015, June 2015, uh, October. And uh, the same comparison for the 2019 and uh, 19. And then after uh, reading this uh, field information in Seagrass Mapper, you will be able to do the classification. Uh, 
this is an example of 2015, uh, where you see uh, this green uh, colors are seagrass habitats detected by seagrass mapper. And uh, in December, uh, the, the size of these green patches has decreased, but you, still some of the, uh, uh, the seagrasses are remaining in the uh, coastal zone. And this number here indicate the overall accuracy uh, of the classified images. I did the same analysis for 2019. Uh, accuracy is very poor. I'm still working on improvement of the training data set. Uh, but the key point here is that a lot of seagrass uh, has disappeared in winter time after, uh, uh, as you can see in this uh, image taking November 2nd, you see uh, the green patches, which was abandoned here, has gone. And uh, this was uh, corresponding very well with our uh, ground truthing survey result. So I was uh, curious to know, uh, I will be skipping this slide, by the way. I was curious to know what was the CIFAR space temperature was like and uh, found out sea surface temperature was higher in 2019, uh, exceeded 30 degrees Celsius, and uh, it was lower than uh, 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, information published from the uh, local fishery institute. I did the same analysis by using satellite sea surface uh, temperature uh, for two different uh, sensors. Uh, one is uh, sea surface temperature obtained by Modis Aqua, another is uh, NASA beers. And uh, the both sensor indicated higher surface temperature in uh, 2019. So uh, to conclude this case study, uh, large scale seagrass die off possibly uh, due to high summer temperature was observed in 2019, but not 2015. And uh, classification of seafloor uh, with both Landsat 8 uh, and Sentinel 2 MSI showed high accuracy, except April and July 2019. For these months, I, uh, I can explain, uh, in the, if necessary, in the Q, Q and A, while I see this uh, low accuracy. Uh, why we have this ex exceptional case. Uh, let me continue uh, to explain uh, my attempt to, to get an interannual changes of seagrass uh, habitats uh, by uh, organizing information for, uh, from these four different uh, RCs. Uh, occasions. Uh, we merged the training data set into three types. Uh, for dense seagrass, dense seagrass with seaweed, I uh, just simply made this class as seagrass. And from sandy, muddy bottom and sparse glass was defined sandy bottom. And uh, for seaweed, uh, this remains the same. And then these are the the sample data set uh, that I uh, created uh, to do the classification for a uh, longer time lease. And uh, by picking these sampling points, like uh, I had to choose the locations that I'm, we are very sure that seagrass uh, always exist in, in this case study site. For example, like in this green parches, like, uh, we know that seagrass are always there uh, during the, uh, throughout the years. And uh, for these locations, we are so sure it is always a sandy bottom. And this red patches here is that we are very sure this, is, uh, this seaweed grows on top of the rocky leaves and uh, always there are seaweed here. So uh, selecting this, uh, sampling points are uh, important. 
when this is the case study, uh, you see very, very like high accurate numbers. Uh, and again, uh, this is a preliminary phase and uh, depends on the uh, classification algorithm, you might, you might get this kind of like high or low uh, accuracy. This is a classification done by a random forest algorithm. And, uh, and this is not the realistic, this is not a good example. So um, we are right now working on refining the algorithm and uh, depends on the algorithm you choose, you might end up like getting super high accuracy result, which is not realistic. So uh, this, some of the, the work has been successful and uh, some of the work, especially changing the interannual changes of seagrass distribution in, in the Nano Bay is not uh, really working as I expected. Okay. Uh, there are more information given in the, uh, the manuals of seagrass mapper and the manuals of seagrass trainer and appendix. Uh, this is just uh, one example of mapping uh, seagrass using seagrass, uh, seagrass habitat using seagrass mapper. And uh, I hope this uh, case study uh, uh, gave you some idea to, uh, to try to use seagrass mapper in your case study site. Well, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Okay, uh, okay, uh, please ask questions if any. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Murata san, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you talk now? Okay. Okay. Th thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. Please explain that the low accuracy uh, classification. Okay. The, the reason why I ended up with okay. okay the number of class in CLS3 in this case seaweed the, the number of samples were very very small like there are only like a few points of uh, a seaweed in the in this part of the section and uh, here you see a lot of uh, seaweed uh, patches here but this is not the case so in this case because the number of the samples in this class is so small it's better to get rid of this class from the beginning uh, for classification did i answer your question okay thank you mm. And just just one uh, one additional information is that currently there is no option to to ignore uh, those. Once all the sample is deployed in the cloud, the Seagrass mapper has to use uh, all all the training data set uh, sent to the Seagrass mapper, and uh, we are working on the uh, uh, improvement of the. Uh, Seagrass mapper uh, so that Sigra, new Seagrass mapper can ignore some of the class if you wants to. Okay. Uh, I see one question. Uh, do I understand correctly that Grand Truth was used only to label training data obtained from satellite image? Did you use different models for different satellite? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, let me 
uh, first answer the, the very first question. Yes, uh, the uh, ground truth data was used only. Ground, ground data was used only to lay the training data. Mikael, uh, can you, uh, how do I, okay. Uh, I'm trying to uh, enable your microphone, but I didn't clearly understand your first question. If you can, okay. Uh, if you can talk and, uh, okay, now I think you are ready to talk. If you can talk and explain the very first question, can you, can you explain a little bit details? Your, micro, your microphone is on, by the way. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, amazing. Uh, so my question was about the, uh, the process by which you have uh, trained this model. Uh, so which like I'm just uh, confirming that my understanding is correct. Uh, you have obtained uh, points in um, in space and time of uh, certain classes that you have then uh, used to uh, train the model based on uh, the satellite imagery at that uh, point in time. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, my second question is um, because you have used uh, different satellites that have uh, different imaging capabilities, uh, did you? use um different models for uh, for them or okay. in what way did you have to account for that for the different capabilities in this case study that i'm presenting i just used a random forest model uh, and uh, i used the same model for two different sensor which is landsat 8 uh, oli and uh, Sentinel-2 MSI. Uh, so uh, as I understand, you have uh, deemed that the results were uh, similar enough to not uh, require any specific treatment, correct? Yes. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we will be, uh, yeah, I will be uh, explaining a little bit more uh, during uh, our hands-on exercise tomorrow. Uh, we, Random Forest is one of the supervised uh, classification model uh, that is used in CGRAS mapper. There are other uh, models like uh, support vector machines and uh, Magzen, and uh, I forgot one, uh, just one more, but uh, there are uh, four, four models for supervised classification. Okay. Uh, 